Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So thanks for joining us today. And I guess if there's anyone online who doesn't know who we are, I'm Sam. Um, and Andrew is also going to talk today and Renzo <laughs> um, about this project that we've been working on to get um, basal optimized for the ventral temporal cortex. Um, and Andrew and I are both uh, postdocs in Alex's section here at the NIMH. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll jump right in and say that, um, you know, we know Vaso has been successfully applied to primary sensory and motor cortices. Um, so these are areas like um, M1 and V1 and um, S1 as people are doing things like um, touching and looking at simple visual stimuli and tapping. And we know from these studies that you know, VESA seems to be um, doing a good job that it's, um, we can see differences in feedback and feed forward um, activation across layers that seem to map onto the anatomical connections um, that we know are there, which is exciting. Um, what we're trying to do is uh, bring this to um, higher order cognition. Um, and so we're really interested in areas that are further along in the cortical processing stream. Um, and we're trying to answer questions like these. So um, how are feed forward and feedback signals organized across layers in category selective cortex, like um, areas of the brain that care about faces and scenes and more complex visual stimuli? And also questions of memory, like how are medial temporal lobe layers involved in encoding and retrieval? How are memories stored and represented across cortical layers? Um, we're not actually gonna talk about these questions very much today. We're really uh, at this point just trying to optimize a vaso sequence so that we can um, apply it to areas of the brain that should be involved in these higher order cognitive questions. Um, and so that's what Andrew and I have been working on for many, many months now, and Renzo has joined us recently as well. Um, and it turns out it's not a trivial task. So um, these are kind of the areas that we care about. This is the ventral surface of the brain. Um, the areas we care about are very medial, kind of circled in red. And eventually we wanna be able to, um, to be imaging the fusiform face area, which is a cortical area that responds to um, what's well, involved in perception and recognition of faces, parapocampal place area, which is involved in um, perception and recognition of scenes or places, and uh, the entrainal cortex and hippocampus, which were involved in memory, of course. Um, but unfortunately, these areas are really challenging to image, even with standard EPI. And that's because um, of the proximity of these areas to the sinuses, which renders them really susceptible to dropout and distortions and artifacts, low SNR, you know, they're far from the coils. And so um, VASO is not exempt from these issues. Um, we also see these issues in VASO and the sequence that we started with was not really optimized to be able to get good signal in these regions. Uh, and so just to give you an idea, this is where we started. Uh, these are our, the general area that we care about. This is an axial slice. And as you, I hope you can see, <laughs> it's looking pretty dire. <laughs> um, but we have made some, some progress. So um, these are some images of, um, you know, after Andrew and I had been tinkering for a while with the sequence, just changing basic parameters like, um, like flip angle and the bandwidth and the echo time. Um, we were able to at least, you know, get some signal <laughs> in the areas that we care about. Um, but we still have a lot of challenges. So, uh, for example, there's the gray matter, white matter contrast is pretty poor in some of these regions, which makes drawing the layer masks really difficult. Um, we have a lot of uh, artifacts still in, um, in many of the people, these big kind of ripples running through the temporal lobe that often run into our regions that we care about. And our TSNR is very borderline. So it's around 10, which is kind of at the very bottom end of what you would want <laughs> for a VASA sequence, sometimes a little less uh, even. So um, you know, we really want to be able to get that up. Uh, we did optimistically collect some data with the sequence. So I'm gonna show you data from five people as they were doing a category localizer task, um, which means they were looking at pictures of scenes and places um, as well as faces. And we can contrast that uh, to look at or to find the parapocampal place area. And what we should see is that um, PPA cares about yeah places more than faces. Um, and we should see differential category activation according to that. And so 
we found that in the bold data, we were seeing that. So here you have places um, in blue and faces in pink, and you can see a nice, this is a superficial bias in the bold data for place um, information, which is good and not for faces. But when we came to the base line, sorry, are these different subjects or? These are each subject is a line, yes. Yeah. yeah. The VASO data you can see is not really, we don't see a lot of category specificity occurring, um, at least nothing that's really consistent across subjects. So this we thought, you know, was not generally a success and we uh, were thinking this might be a TSNR issue. Um, is, is that percent change? This what is, is the What's yeah, the yeah, it's percent change from fixation. Sorry, the axes are really small. But yeah, from fixation. And we'd expect it to be negative. Um, no, these response. are these are flips, so they should be positive. Yeah. How many boxes do you have per individual? Like for your ROI? I'm not sure off the top of my head. Do you know, Andrew? No, not a few hundred probably. Was he saying a few hundred? Probably. Uh, in the upsampled domain or at the um, no. FMRA native resolution point eight or something? Before upsampled. It's at, oh, so it's point eight, yeah, resolution. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this was just to show you, I mean, we're going to move on from this just because it's not very exciting. It's just meant to show you that there's not a lot going on, um, but, you know, then the great return occurred. <laughs> uh, Renzo joined us back at the NH. He's been really kind in helping us um, kind of improve the sequence further to get us to a place that we're, we're more confident and happy with. Uh, so I'm going to pass it to him because he's going to tell you some of the uh, changes that we've been making to do that. All right. Um... So maybe the first thing, the first kind of compromise we looked at was um, um, playing with the orientation. So, you know, the Nova coil is not going very deep and also kind of it is the individual elements are star shaped aligned with more overlap within the spokes than across, which has implications for, for Grappa. So for a 3D PI, usually we use like a Grappa 3 or so in plane, you would end up with an undersampling pattern like that. You cannot really and do much more than that um, for axial-like slices because you kind of use a circle of elements mostly that contribute most of the signal in the, in the center. This is challenging. You have a lot of proper noise amplification, a chief factor penalty. So by sacrificing one hemisphere going sagittal helps us in many aspects. So basically now we have kind of um, the elements in a two-dimensional grid. So you... So now what we do is don't do any in-plane acceleration, only through-plane acceleration. Um, however, we match it with uh, segmentation of factor three and then spread it out with um, a different pre prephase shifted KIP. So there are no KIP blips. So you end up with basically an identical echo time length. Um, um, and, you, and you don't have the high chief factor penalties anymore because now you basically have different elements both in the in the like read and face direction so here we you see the case and uh, case based undersampling patterns across case set and ky set would be the partitions we have uh, 36 slices here which you can see already boosts our tsnr quite a bit at the cost of uh, giving up one hemisphere the other things that we played around with in a wide parameter search is um avoiding the mechanical resonances, which we do have with our body gradient. And um, one more time, we learned that it's more efficient to go slow. So just going um, going easy on the bandwidth, avoiding mechanical resonances, even though you increase your TR by maybe 10, 15%, it basically improves the t image quality a lot. And this is um, an example case where we went really, really, really close to the mechanical resonances. But you see how much it affects the image quality. Another thing that was not directly surprising or predictive for me, um, but still in a wide parameter search turned out to be quite beneficial was to look at a fat set. So external fat set, not water excitation, which basically again is a trade-off between TR. We add nine milliseconds for the 
um, Siemens SPB fat set module for each segment, um, which is costly in, in, in terms of TR. And our echo times are long enough that we wouldn't really expect a fat ghost. Um, and we don't really see a fat ghost. However, the fat still screws up the Nyquist ghost correction into proper counterfeit. So it is uh, worth it a lot. And here again, showing an extreme case. One thing that I learned also, which I, I guess was a bit surprising, but in retrospect makes sense, is that like here in hippocampus, usually we have these kind of fuzzy ripples. And you see basically the artifacts of these low spatial frequency ghosts. Um, usually people just live with them. However, um, sometimes when the ghosts have interference patterns with very different underlying um, B0, you see these kind of interference patterns, these wiggles or fuzzy ripples, we call them. The interesting thing is that they can be suppressed partly by switching the read direction. So not like the face direction, like people would do for a topper, but switching the read direction, which most sequences don't allow. We have the source code for that EPI module, so we could and try it. And the, the thing that happens here, I believe, is that there are two sources of Nyquist ghosts. The first is the fuzzy ripples that we talked about, basically um, issues with RAM sampling and eddy currents that are not properly accounted for, which introduce ghosting, the fuzzy ripples, the low spatial frequency ghosts. But also we have just off resonance effects, which means that we have like phase error evolutions across and the readout. So basically at the outer periphery of the case space, we have these jumps between odd and even lines, which is another source of ghost. So matching the, um, so we have two ghosts and we basically can try to manage them that they cancel each other out mostly, giving a, like suppressing at least those artifacts. They're not completely gone, which I want to show here. So even in a better case, um, you might be able to use entire hippocampus here, but there are still these wiggles, which you can see by looking at the artifact only flipping back and forth between the different read directions. One potential approach here to account for this even would be to use a, um, what people call like interleaf flyback EPI, basically a dual polarity EPI where you, in this case, um, we look at the odd lines of each EPI module and the even ones flip the read direction for each TR. And then we basically only take the odd of one TR and the even one of the other TR and reconstruct that with the sec loop counter in the sequence, basically making them completely go away, boosting your TSNR, however. And so far, I think this is not what, what um, Sam and Andrew might be using because it's um, in the way how it's implemented right now, you would uh, use the sec loop counter and reconstruct images in ICE by basically merging consecutive TRs, basically having signal leakage across time, which would further be an, a compromise in TR, which is something we might not want. And we are still quite happy with this image, I believe. Though, um, despite our enthusiasm of, uh, of the high quality here, also why we should stay modest, just by showing what it can be, if we would be even more forgiving with respect to TR. So having six segments, you can easily go to like sub 0.1 microliter regime, and then um, you still see it's EPI and have all these like EPI issues, but at the end, um, there's still more work for me to be doing, even though we, we have something that I think we are happy with at the moment. And with this, I give it back to um, Andrew. Renzo, yes. uh, Sean asked whether it's 7TA or B or both. Um, the, and, um, we're going to actually do a comparison of 70A, 70B, and the NMRF 70 next Wednesday in PTX and STX. Um, this image was 70A, this image was 70B. So both. We, that's the nice thing of having source code, right? You can switch it across platforms and it shouldn't make a difference. 70B is slightly more efficient. But um, aside of that, basically identical. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hi, everybody. Um, all right. So coming back to the present here, this image is quite beautiful though. Um, so yeah, so as Renzo said too, like we, to get this nice image quality in, in the sagittal acquisition, we do have to make some compromises. So here, one of them being, so now we're just looking at the right hemisphere. Um, we have 36 slices, they're 0.85 isotropic. And the, um, so, just focusing on a small sliver of, of one hemisphere is, is one sacrifice and the other is 
um, as Renzo also pointed out, the long TR. So our TRs are at six seconds now, um, which is quite long. Um, and that's that's a full TR to collect both the nulled and not nulled image. So um, at this stage, really, it's it's really going for sledgehammer effects of, of using like block designs and, and pretty basic contrasts. Uh, just really briefly about pre-processing. Um, well, I think we do what, what is probably quite standard for most people. Uh, like we make sure the images are de-obliqued. We then despike the data and do a volume registration. Um, so we have switched the, the volume registration. We tried to simplify everything. I have AFNI written at the top here. We tried to, to put everything in our um, in our pipeline to, to just run an AFNI to simplify and also to have, you know, consultation just upstairs if we need it. So everything's basically run on uh, AFNI and then um, using some of the Laney software as well. And the volume registration was the major thing we changed. Um, and uh, we got a lot of help from Paul Taylor there to get 3D vol reg, um, uh, a pretty basic call to 3D vol reg to, um, to give us a, a really nice volume registration for the bold and, and vaso data. If I could just interrupt for a second, a few weeks ago, I collected some vaso data and Renzo and I like tried every which way to motion correct it. And there were real differences between SPM and ANTS and yeah. your tools and AFNI, depending on whether it was with 3D Vol Ridge or 3D right. LA8 or blah, blah, blah. Have you explored that whole matrix of, of different? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we do see different. I haven't like formally like like laid down, you know, um, side by side comparisons, but yes, uh, we have noticed a bit of difference and, and AFNI does do quite a good job. Um, even in the differences with AFNI, depending on which set of parameters used. I'm sorry, say that? There, there were differences within AFNI, depending on how we ran the correction. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't played around too much. I think that well, the main- I, Can I just interrupt? I mean, what, yeah. If you change, if you change cost function, if you change parameters, you you should get different results. It's a question of kind of what you're doing and and maybe why. So I'm I'm happy to chat about it if there's certainly if there's a problem. But yeah, I, I I don't know if there's a problem or a solution. The only point I'm making is it seems to matter. And but but what I mean, what else could it be if you if you change? programs or tools or options or cost functions or something doesn't the result kind of has to change doesn't it so uh no i don't think that's true i think if you use a standard full sequence with full brain coverage you're less susceptible to these decisions no no i don't agree i agree with paul it's incorrect like it all depends on your parameters and cost function and I mean, I think it might interact with the noise level of the data. So if you have really noisy data to begin with, maybe like if you change some parameters, the results might change like more than the ones that would change with the less noisy data. But I mean, it's at the end, just computer. <laughs> I don't think it's just noise. I think it's field of view. I think it's- Partial volume, partial volume is important here and making, yeah. making them. So the, the thing with Sam and, um, and Andrew and Javier and that, uh, looking at these things is really the the masking of it kind of matters so that you're not susceptible to essentially just aligning the edge of your field of view, which is right. what things were happening. So, I mean, we have a kind of solution for it. So I'm very happy to talk about this more, but I, I think there are ways to kind of make it stable. But if you, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you, depending on what you're changing, you, you will get kind of different results. It just depends. And that weighted ma what, what Paul's saying too about masking and, and getting rid of edge effects mm -hmm. across runs um, was a huge difference. So using a, like a weighted Gaussian mask to basically erode, um, even just really coarsely, just to erode um, the edges of the, of the field of view made a huge difference. I, I guess this is kind of an area where you know, different people are trying different things. And I'm very happy to try. I think there is kind of a solution with um, the Sam and Andrew um, and I seem to have worked out that that works pretty well. So I'm very happy to look at this. I, I think it's a case of, you know, a little bit similar to some of the acquisition stuff that we're talking about where, yeah. you know, there's kind of an information propagation thing. So, I mean, I'm, I'm I here. I think I want to push back on Peruka a little bit. I think it does matter more for these data than for like low resolution bold data. For I agree. 
right? Yeah, but you are asking for zero tolerance between like algorithms that are implemented in- I'm, not, I mean, I'm just pointing out that there's more sensitivity to the parameters with these data than with standard full data. Hmm. I, I agree with that. And part, part of it's the partial voluming aspect. And then yeah. part of it is is the level of detail and, you know, sometimes the context. Tolerance for error is, is different because we're looking at very small effects spatially. Sure. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. But but again, I, I'm not surprised, but I, I'm just agreeing with that aspect. Yeah, the, the expectation that if I change software tool, if I change cost function, I should get the same thing. I, that I would not expect, so. Yeah. Sure. The tolerance for differences is lower. That's the point. Uh, with regards to the spatial aspect, like what is this deobliquing to volumes step? Can we, can we agree that cost functions will change shape depending on yes. what? Yes. Okay, so that's what we've just said. I think we should keep on going. Okay. Okay. So, oh, did you, I'm sorry, uh, Farouk, would you, you asked about the deobliquing? Yeah, deobliquing to volume. So the deobliquing um, was way more consequential in the in the axial where we were tilting our, angling our, C, our, our volume, our field of view quite a bit. And so deobliquing just sets everything back to a... But I mean, does it involve resampling? Are you resampling it into a new grid? No, I do not. I don't believe so. Paul, is that? It... I'm, I'm not sure why is it needed, like deobliquing. It, it sounds like a resampling involved step, and that might have something like special. Yeah, there, well, there, there are two meanings to deoblique. One is apply the obliquity, and that's a resampling process. And then the other one is purge it and forget about it, and that's a non resampling. So I, I have to actually go back and look at the. Um, the script for what's being applied. But I think the point is to not resample at any point unnecessarily. Yeah. And here it's not resampling it. No. Uh, I would be surprised if that were the case. I think that is not the case. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, and then, like I said, uh, the rest, is, so Laney, we use Laney to, to, to null the VASO with the bold. Um, we detrend across the runs and then we just use select. So like I said, we're using a basic, um, really simple block design. So we're just using really simple. We don't use a GLM, we just selective average across the our conditions. And um, as Sam had pointed to earlier, our, our regions of interest are generally in this area, uh, fusiform gyrus, parahippocampal gyrus. And so, oh, the other, Processing pre-processing step that's been talked about quite a bit lately is we've been applying Nordic and actually I, I guess I should have showed on the last slide the very first thing we do is apply the Nordic and we've looked at it both ways with and without Nordic and so if you just look at TSNR maps it does a great job so as um, I think Renzo had showed on one of his slides already without the Nordic just just the the new sagittal acquisition we get better TSNR it uh we got a jump of about you know like five points or something from roughly 10 or so to more probably more around the 15 15 ish uh area there and with nordic you get an uh, almost double that which is which is wonderful um and so uh moving forward i'm just going to show you the nordic data analyzed data we've looked at it both ways it looks very similar both ways quality it's qualitatively the same, which is which is very nice to see. Um, and what what you do get is just a better uh, a, a, a little bit of a jump in effect size. Real quick, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, what you're showing here, this uh -huh. is all the vaso volumes, not the um, bold ones. Oh, over on the left here. These are the um like the uh the T one weight. So the um the uh what is it the the standard the, the on the left it's yeah. i think a, a a variance across null versus yeah, not yeah. Not, which is yeah, basically dominated by the t1 the inversion pulse but also a bit of like other sources of variance which helps right. usually to make csf look even darker but what you're saying about the tsnr that's for your your oh i'm sorry yeah these are these are for the that's for the vaso so so in bold the the bold the bold's quite a, a bit better the bold is tends to be what almost double the usually tends to be 
Actually, no, that's not quite true. In the va in the in the newer and the sagittal, it's not quite it's not as an extreme difference between the vaso and the bold. I would I would be okay. without Nordic. I would bet the bold is in the high teens, maybe twenties, around more like the twenty regime. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, what happened here? Ah. Yeah. So right now, so we're just piloting and. Um, we don't have tons of data to show, but so that so right now, so today I'm just going to show you in one participant, and um, and all and we're just doing um, faces versus places, um, like Sam described. So in this person, we were able to collect three runs. Each run had um, eight blocks of each condition, and um, each block was 24 seconds on. Yeah. Sorry, where did the stimuli from? These are from uh, Penn, uh, Russell Epstein's lab. Yeah. Uh, and so we had an on off. So we we have 24 seconds on, 18 seconds off. So the end, um, that just equals four, four TRs of stimuli, three TRs of, of fixation in between. And then we can look at the, the contrast. Um, we can compare the faces versus the places. So this is, so we're just doing this in a, in a, in the, um, using an ROI approach, um, a functional ROI approach. So here in this one person, we had three runs, we collected three runs. So we first, this is the bold data. We first looked at the one, uh, the first run to define our regions of interest. And here, I don't, can you see my mouse? Yes. They can. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. So here, so faces are going to be warm colors, places are going to be cool colors. And you can see in the, in this coronal slice, FFA, uh, PPA, uh, in, the, in the lateral to the medial, and then here in different sagittal slices, um, you can kind of see, see where they're laying, lying here in the image. So, so we su select these where we want to draw our layers based on the bold data in run one. And then we're using this T1 optimized um, image that I'm showing you here to draw the layers. So, so after selecting where we want to draw them, we just hand draw based on these images. And I'll talk about it later, but for for a second, but one of the one of the setbacks here is that this image will, um, the contrast here isn't great. So even drawing these the layers on it um, is something that we need to get. Uh, we need to get a better um, uh, kind of T1 weighted image, and we've been working on that, which I'll show you in, in just a second. Can you, can yeah. You show it on this one slide or multiple no, slides? yeah, it's 3D. So, so yeah, they're isotropic um, voxels. So yeah, we we draw them across uh, this across several, probably I would say like 15 to 20 slices thick. So. It's kind of time consuming. <laughs> You're drawing with ITK Snap, or what's your tool of choice? No, no, we're using a uh, FSL. So, um, but Laney's growing the layers. Laney, Laney, yeah, we use Laney to actually grow the layers, but we're we're drawing the borders in FSL. And we've actually just recently in in the lab we purchased some iPads, which we can, um, use a uh, we can use to mirror the um mirror to the desktop and and use the uh, stylus to um to draw the layers it's makes makes life a little bit easier than using the mouse to to draw and click which lane the program are you using to get the layers <laughs> what is it called layer me what is what is the layer draw grow oh, yeah. layers or what's it called yeah two ellen two layers or ellen grow layers oh we use grow layers, grow layers. yeah yeah yeah, mm -hmm. that's the legacy one, and I, I think Renzo would agree that I high, highly recommend you to switch to LN two layers where we. Yeah, yeah, we talked about this the other day while we were scanning, and and what did you say? You yeah, let's let's switch. Though we need to make sure to like set the defaults right because I think. Oh right, we were talking about yeah. Eli was that yeah. like it doesn't include the borders, for example, if you don't say it, or you need to make sure that there are approximately equal number of boxes per layer and those kind of things. But you, we should definitely switch. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, Farouk, like what are the, is, did Renzo like summarize why we should switch there? Or like, did you have other things in mind or what? 
Yeah, I mean, the benefits are manifold. Like I fixed a couple of bugs inside the old uh, layer code and like, but, but also like you need to like, we made it a bit more general, like, it, like um, so it might change your like drawing uh, uh, pipeline a bit to knowing how like LN2 layers performs. Uh, like there's this include border streak and like other stuff, maybe you don't need to do them. Uh, okay. I, I feel that there is like some, like I, I, like we discussed with Renzo too, like there's always a confusion between like the old, like legacy part of Laney and the new part of Laney. Mm -hmm. And I, I think by like three years has passed now and I think it might be a good idea to like use the newer portions uh, because they are more general, more correct uh, and so forth. And Farouk, you'd recommend upsampling the data before drawing? Um, yes, like Laney LN2 layers, the default parameters are optimized for around 0.2 millimeter isotropic data. However you get to that data is none of our concern, but the, the defaults are optimized for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I guess, yeah, I, I, I didn't mention that. So at this point, we've upsampled the data by a factor four. So it goes from about 0.8 isotropic to 0.2 millimeter isotropic at this at this stage of, of drawing the layers. Drawing the layers and the time series. Yes, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're in the same space. Um, drawing in 3D is hard. It's a pain. It's a super huge pain. So maybe uh, you'll probably be interested maybe um, in, in like in how, in our acquisition, we're, we're getting a better opti T1 optimized image that <clears throat> has the same distortions as our our VASO data, which- that, That's not what this is. No, 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 I'll show you later. No, no, here, no, this is definitely limited. It's a, by the, the pain of not, not great uh, contrasts, yeah. yeah. So like about that, if I can just say like two things, <laughs> because it's always coming back to like, Drawing in 3D being hard, like yes, it is hard, but this is what we have to do with high accuracy and precision. Yeah, I mean, we cannot say that hey, like we just do the minimal work and just like survive with it. No, like we have to do it good and we have to do it like precise enough. So th there are also ways to improve on it. Uh, like if little tool, for instance, I was suggesting uh, this nonlinear anisotropic uh, smoothing tool. Uh, one implementation is available in AFNI. That would help you to uh, like boost your edge contrast a little bit in these noisy images. That could be like a way to go, especially in the upsampled uh, data. It should work better actually. It's diffusion algorithm. Mm -hmm. There are other strategies to to do too. So maybe something for the future. <laughs> so and that's upsampling in three D. So you go from whatever eighteen slices to many more. That's right. Yeah, it's three D upsampled. Uh huh. Yeah. So like when we were doing the motor cortex stuff, I guess maybe that's what you're alluding to. We would only upsample in in yeah. plane. Yeah. 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 And it's thirty six slices. Yeah, that's thirty six. So it turns into well times four. So yeah, it becomes a big data set. Hundred and fifty something. So when when you draw it, do you draw each slice individually, and then you have to kind of go through and make sure that totally. They, they match up? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of yeah. It is definitely a pain. So yeah, it it requires we're looking at all three, um, three views, and we so we pick. So I I, I point out too like where we how we drew the layers. Like it's um we drew the the FFA in the on the axial slice because that's just the best going across where you can see the gray matter white matter border the best. Whereas um for the PPA on the right we drew it in the coronal. And that's really just uh, a convenience thing. It's just whatever one is going to make it easiest. And it, yeah, and getting them to line up all like across layer, across slices is difficult too. These these gyri are quite convoluted. So it's the shapes. Well, about that thing, uh, again, if I can offer like <laughs> two cents. <laughs> yeah. Um, like for instance, you are working on the upsampled image regime, which mm -hmm. means that the, like the amount of information, spatial frequency is not, at the level of your upsampled, like nominally upsampled like data, right? So in theory, like you have this curvature, like cortex that is like uh, oversampled and you can actually skip, like for instance, every three slices or every two slices. Yeah. 
and that segment like every third slice and then I apply like a closing operation, which is like dilate and erode to, to fill in the gaps. And also yeah. like on top of this or in combination with this, you can apply um, uh, a bit of like dilation, erosion, maybe in between a little bit of Gaussian smoothing to make sure the slices that you are segmenting is continuous and smooth over space. So like having a bit of these like little like things in the middle can decrease your amount of manual work drastically. Yeah, you can you please show us? I think we should have a whole Wednesday meeting where we watch you draw. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, so uh, for one thing that we do, so in um, FSL, and Sam Sam showed me the trick of like, you can um, make the make your drawing tool, I guess, thicker in a, in a so so she you know, we can draw like one layer, but we're actually drawing like two. two mm -hmm. So we're it's working. That's actually yeah, funny. Right? That's not a good idea because it's never a good idea to draw on something you are not seeing. <laughs> I agree. So that's why I was about to. I, that said, I was about to ask you the this erosion dilation routine that you use. Is that how do you implement that in Laney, or what do you do? I have a simple like a Python script that does it, but Afni has implementations. FSL Mats has like dilation error. Like th these are like super simple morphological operations and oh, okay, and that's, like and that's a little really program. You just plug in your segmentation and it just does it for you. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> ITK Snap won't do that. There's no. ITK of... Snap has something inside too, and I think they improved it in the last version, three point nine, I think. Uh, but I, I mean, like I didn't use it too much, but like these are like super simple operations. So whatever, wherever is implemented, I think you can use it. They're simple operations. I, drawing in 3D, especially in V1, just drives me crazy. I don't feel confident <laughs> in my ability to do it. Yeah, it's a huge pain. Hold on. So um, Eli, you use ITK Snap? I'm I'm trying to. I'm beginning to. I'm not an expert. I think there are, uh, I think there are pros amongst us. I think... Tyler said she likes IT. You like ITK, ITK stamp? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add in the uh, Farouk's comments, but <laughs> the newest version of ITK snap four um, that just came out has really nice, uh, oh, got two screens. Yeah, um, <laughs> has really nice machine learning algorithms to actually not just expand kind of linearly, but actually use like, learns networks oh that, cool that you can basically just do like every eighth slice or every fourth slice or whatever to save a lot of time hmm. and then you just say fill and it has kind of like learned the contrast in the ones that you did and then just fills in between oh, um, that's yeah. right. i'm not joking i think it'd be worth having a, a session on this yeah I, we actually you know I agree. a segment of brain together because it's such a critical step in getting layer responses. You do it wrong and you're not looking at layers. Absolutely. Have y'all tried FSL and like to, to see which one is, is ITK snap much easier, like uh, user friendly and everything else as, as well? That's awful. I wouldn't say much easier. That's yeah, awful. They're different. Um, yeah. FSL is nice because you're basically like drawing points that are not linked to the pixels that you're drawing on. So you can draw anywhere. And yeah, it's a, it's a layer, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. As opposed to an ITK snap, you really only have the volume itself. And so you're you're explicitly drawing on it, manually classifying this voxel as something. I got you. Um, so you have to make that decision in the first place. But but beyond that, I find it more intuitive and quicker. But um, but you do episode stuff very, very fast. So either way, yeah. I think yes. it's just what you've learned. Yes. And yeah. in ITK Snap, there are a lot of cool things if you know how to use them. And I I was hoping that Farouk might actually teach us how to do ITK Snap or Farouk and Tyler. Yeah, yeah that would be but whatever yeah. you like know the best, you are the fastest and then you're the fastest but you know the best and then it's hard to yeah i'm uh, like i'm happy to contribute but like if i can say again like one little thing like i mean sometimes these discussions turns into what like a person used in the past right because whatever they use they like to, that one best however like itk snap has a substantial um like advantage which is the use of shortcuts like many like the the, the brushes and buttons have quick sh keyboard shortcuts and I mean, if you ever got involved with like graphic design or digital arts, 
when you use like Photoshop and Illustrator, like these shortcuts are what makes you really fast, uh, mm -hmm. like rather than clicking around. And ITK Snap has them. And like, this is a big advantage over, uh, because you can train muscle memory to, to go fast, like, oh, select the brush, uh, increase the brush a bit, like go three slices up, three slices down. Uh, all can be like mechanically learned. Cool. That's the advantage. <laughs> It's a skill in itself, undoubtedly. Yeah. yeah. But one that, I mean, that sounds yeah. definitely worth learning. Like, I agree with Eli that this is definitely worth pursuing, like having a group meeting, tutorial, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Or on our own, I'm happy to buy, Tyler, I'm happy to buy you a coffee or something if you want to <laughs> sit and draw ITK snap players with us. What a great afternoon. Right? <laughs> yeah, it sounds exciting. <laughs> okay. All right, so at this point, yeah, again, ROI approach where we're defining, we've defined our layers and um, based on the data from one run. And like I said, we collected three runs in this person. So now, oh crap, I didn't, <laughs> the animation didn't work. So the big reveal, <clears throat> but I guess so. So what you can see here is first in the bold, you get the superficial bias you'd expect and you, also get really nice category selectivity in the in the two left out runs. So that's wonderful. And then the other thing that's really promising in this person is that you're getting the selectivity also in the vaso. And the exciting thing is also that it does seem to be shifted more to the middle of the layers. Like so like a middle hump, which um could could be indicative of a feed forward um mm -hmm. A feed forward signal. I would say that with a, a big a big caveat of, of like what I was just saying about growing about drawing these layers on this um on not the best contrasted image. Uh I don't know. I think we could do better feeling uh get our confidence level up that our layer borders are are firmly on the the white matter and the and uh the peel surface. Is there a reason that that took I'm assuming traditionally people look at faces versus persons and guys are looking at them individually. Is that just to get an idea of what the data look like? No, well, so typically, yeah, exactly. So typically, like in an ROI approach, you would, in your localizer, you would directly contrast faces and places or faces and objects or whatever, and you'd use that to define your let your regions. But then when you extract the stats, you you want to keep the conditions separate so you can see directly compare them instead of because you know if you just if you just showed the contrast or the subtraction you're kind of losing some information about about the selectivity in the upsam yeah i'm going to get somewhere around like more like 20 ish for sure right yeah, yeah. I, I don't know exactly but yeah um it, it's also and it's not it's definitely not a set number like it's it's based on again since we're defining it functionally we look at our you know so for ffa our face blob and that's going to dictate how how many slices we're going to draw to because we're just going to try and get that whole blob you know we're going to keep going until we get to the edge of it oh i'm sorry yeah 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 20 layers i'm sorry that's that's kind of i thought you meant how many slices sorry misheard yeah no 20 yeah for these it's it's 20. Mm -hmm. Sorry, how about the thickness of uh, FFA and PPA? So the gray matter? It's about maybe two and a half millimeters. Yeah. So the original uh, voxel, maybe you have two or uh, two and a half uh, voxel for each. Yeah, the we have about, yeah, I would say we have about three, three voxels that, that would span the cortical ribbon, yeah. Sure. Andrew, could I just get that straight? How many layers did you draw yeah well, well wait, do you mean slices or how many layers no no how many layer like yeah, how many layers yeah, so we're using 20 and that's just you know just to get a smooth across layer function here but you draw on each one manually no 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 okay, so, so you're so, basically I'm, I'm trying to say how many how many have you actually defined and then you're interpolating correct yeah exactly so we go slice by slice drawing our borders for where we're going to draw fill in the layers yes and then we just fill in with twenty, which the grow the the laney. Uh, so I'm asking how many how many layers have you manually drawn? 
like in the in the FFA. Oh, you grow. How many? Do, how many? So how many of those do you actually have to draw in? Yeah. How many have you drawn? Oh, I'm not sure what you mean. I, I guess like the, you just draw the border, so you would draw the. You you're draw just drawing. On. So you're just doing the. You're just doing gray matter, white matter. Yeah, gray, gray matter, okay. white matter border, okay. gray matter, uh, sulcus border. And then you don't, you don't have the contrast to define anything else there, really. Not no. with this. Yeah. Not with this. No. Data. Well, okay. this, this, this is a pet peeve of mine, uh, as Renzo knows. I mean, you know, so you define the borders. That's fine. Um, uh, you have your uh, peel surface and you have your gray white matter boundary. And then calling it 20 layers is A, there are not 20 layers. B, these are not layers. These are equidistant parcellations of your boundary conditions, basically. Um, th that's it. And with, the, with these kinds of pulse sequences, the 3D pulse sequences, I mean, you would be lucky to actually have three voxels across those two boundaries. You would be very lucky to have three three real life voxels across those boundaries. So I'm always curious when you know we use ten, for example, when we mm -hmm. use um, Laney, um, which is of course already way more than there really are. Uh, and now you're going to twenty. I'm just curious why why you need to even go that far. I think like just the more you have, like it's not really layers, it's just the bin size, right? Ideally, it's yeah, but it's fake, it's totally fake bin size. You you okay. can't extrapolate or interpolate forever. No, the information is simply not there. Otherwise, people would image at 16 by 16 and and arbitrarily interpolate to 256 by 256. I mean, that's not true. <laughs> no, no, this is this is wrong thinking. Yeah. So Ravi, in your um, early work, you what you did was have kind of the voxel centroid based on the distance of the borders, right? And for that one, technically, because the voxel centroid has a unique distance to gray matter and white matter border, each voxel has its own layer. It's not binned at all. So I think the crown truth is that the number of layers is the number of voxels you have. And then mm -hmm. because we have an SNR problem and we want to average, we kind of bin them and average into layers which basically smooths our depth resolution. Of course, the kind of the, the point split function across cortical depth is still determined by the voxel and the, the 3D readouts. Right. But choosing the bin size is not something that should yeah, be- Yeah, and the bins, you can have arbitrary number of bins, sure. Uh, and just when you're trying to ascribe biological meaning, uh, I think you have to be a little careful. And I think maybe the terminology here might might be a way out. That what you call layers is mm -hmm. it's just like layers in the English word of layers. You, if you don't say yes. architectonical layers according to Broadman, then you should be fine. And like there, are, Kajal said there are nine layers, and other people said there are like three layers. It's you just need to be careful to not imply that there are kind of Broadman six layers, which is would be an issue. So that's why I would always. Uh, advertise or um, recommend people not to use six layers because that would be really confusing. <laughs> well, there are only four <laughs> vascular layers, so <laughs> we should probably be using four if at all. Yeah, That's but like, uh, I, I'm sorry, but this is this is kind of a discussion that I'm like seeing for the <laughs> 10 years and I think it's wrong in many aspects, like how we think about it. It's like due to the history. Like what we are doing, like I agree with Renzo that neuro neurobiological layers, there's something else here. We are talking about geometric layers, geometric definition sure. of them. And like we have a chunk of tissue, two surfaces, like an in inner surface and the outer surface. This could be whatever, your wheel too, like doesn't need to be a uh, cortex. And basically we are measuring distances between like two close points yeah. in these like two surfaces. And like that is all also in our case is a normalized distance measurement. So we normalize it with the cortical thickness at that yeah. local uh, point. And this is like a, a, a metric space that lives in between zero and one. Uh, and like then the, the decision of like, oh, how many beans I should put there is like totally arbitrary. And I think like people kind of overinterpret into this number of beans because of the historical implementations of this this idea which was using the the uh, surfaces triangular meshes uh, like i'm skipping some details 
But like, and also that's why I want to emphasize the, the power of LN2 layers, the new implementation, because it gives two main outputs. One is the traditional like layers output, however many beans you want, but there's a like a better, more fundamental output now it is giving. It's called the metrics output, metric output, and it's equidistance metric output. Th that gives for each voxel, like whether you upsample or whatever, is, is the exact value, normalized distance value that is measured. And that's a floating point precision value that we do not, actually we should not like just put into an arbitrary bin. Therefore, actually I would say that like a bit more correct in a way, like way of looking at this layer profiles is to use the metric file. And then instead of line plots, switch to a scatter plot. And if the scatter plot is too busy, switch to a 2D histogram, because that will give like a nice uh, sampling of each of these like voxels are differently oriented and like uh, partial volume and so forth. That's like a much more natural way of looking at it before we decide how many bins we want to have inside? Because then, then we can still decide. Oh, we, I want to have now six bins. Yeah, okay. Omer, yeah, yeah. But I, to Ravi's point, no matter from a the biological standpoint, at best you have three compartments, right? You got superficial, you got deep, and something in the middle. Yeah. And as I understand it, you know the, the arbitrary divisions, whether it's ten or twenty is simply to give us a kind of a smoother looking curve. But the interpretation is, is going to be limited right now to those three compartments. There's not much. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, you this I agree. Yeah. yeah, you are talking a, about the effective that, resolution. I think yes. that, that yeah. was yeah, Ravi's that, point. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, that's that's my only point. I mean, you, you can have as many well, you know, binned, or interpolate layers as you want. That that's just mechanical for the purposes of, of you know, generating you know uh, laminar profiles and and trying you know when you're averaging across regions, it's very useful to have that too, of course. Um, but yeah, ultimately, it's superficial, middle, and deep. That's that's mm -hmm. about what we can say right now. Which you which you can still say a lot from that, of course. So it's not that it's it's useless, but. I mean, what you really want is some kind of depth dependent autocorrelation function, which will then tell you how much independence you have between those, those 20 or 100 or 10 or however many layers you draw. And that, that will be how you interpret things, essentially. I don't know how to do it, but that's basically what you want. <laughs> no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And what Alex was saying too, yeah, like the... the Using 20 is just, it gives you a nice smooth function that you can then kind of see where your, your peak is. If you, if you go too low, obviously you're, you're so, your resolution is so low, it's, it's kind of difficult to see any sort of real pattern emerging out of the function um, across the layers or uh, across depths, across superficial, mid, medium, and, and deep depths. But also importantly, um, I think it, it's nice to have more Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just a five <laughs> comment. But like, in terms of deciding, like if you just leave it as three, that's fine. And for the biological interpretation, that can be helpful. But at the beginning stages of a project, it's nice to have more, just because with more bins, you can see more artifacts as well. Or at least that's been my my experience in the past. Is if you just start with the three that you want to interpret off of. You don't really know if something's kind of in there without like it popping out. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they won't be one to one matchings, anyways. I mean, it's it's not like your 20 layers will translate into, you know, six, six, and six, for example. I mean, they're going to be, you know, 10 will be superficial. And then, you know, I don't know, six may be. Yeah, you know, middle and then three may be deep or something like that. If you have a lot of bins, you can actually try to figure out what that might look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we're running late. Let me just wrap up. I think I yeah. have like yeah. another slide or two. But anyway, it's quite promising here that we're actually seeing selectivity in the vaso and that it actually does seem like it's pushing into 
the middle depths, which could be, you know, which would be consistent with like a food forward um, signal to the to the pictures. So the next couple of things we want to do, as, as I said, a drawback is drawing layers. So Renzo has been optimizing the T1 contrast in the in our in our Vaso sequence. And um it so on the left is the one we have been using, on the right is the one that we're just grabbing, and it looks leaps and bounds better. And it's very nice for registration purposes because it'll have the same distortions as the as the um uh, Vaso, uh, the functional data, so it'll be straightforward to to register. So optimistic that that will will get our our layer drawing much better. And then the last thing is to do something more um, theoretically interesting, and also um, as I'll show, like methodologically too, it'll be helpful for for figuring out which which depths we're at. So. The next thing, now that we we're piloting and we're we're getting selectivity, we want to add in the condition of of imagery. So, in addition to showing blocks of, we're going to show famous faces and places, uh, and a lot. So, in in the perceiving condition, they'll see the name like uh, Barack Obama, uh, followed by a picture of him. Um, in the um, imagery condition or, or blocks, they'll see again the, the name Barack Obama, but then just a scrambled up image. And um, in both cases, before they go into the scanner, the, the subject's instructed to, as soon as they see the name, to think about this person to to get a to get a mental image. So the contrast there would be in the imagery blocks. There is no there is no uh, stimulus, whereas uh, in the the perceived blocks there are. Or, it, yeah. Um, are the scrambled scrambled of? Yeah, it's it's yeah. They're just scrambled up images of that. So then, kind of, it shares some of the properties. With this the picture of property. absolutely. So this is something that we've been talking about in the last week, couple of weeks. Is that yeah, these images for for visual studies are great because you scramble up the the percept, but they're still the low level features are kind of still in these images is this your concern that you're still so you have some feed forward information going yeah exactly. yeah so exactly I think it's, so if you have a picture of the eiffel tower and you have a picture of uh, the empire state building are the scrambled versions the low level features of the eiffel tower and the low level features? no so that would be another thing to do right where you just average everything and do the scrambling. Yeah. yeah. So the other thing was to say, like, instead of just ha even just having this picture, maybe just have like a blank, like a square, like a frame. Sure. And then the instructions could be, you know, fill the picture frame with the, with your mental image or something. Right. Actually, just to tricky pack on that, it depends on the goal of this experiment. Are you trying to keep the feed forward input exactly the same? No, not necessarily. Really, real is very stick hammer, right? Like, we want to show that there's a feed forward input when you're actually seeing pictures of faces or places that should, uh, and this is just a little model from, from this Lawrence paper um, from a couple, a few years ago. Um, so like middle layers should be getting feed forward information, superficial and or deep should be getting feedback information. And so the idea here is, is really nothing more than to say that we have a condition that is a feed forward condition and a condition that's more strictly a feedback condition to dissociate layers. Yeah. No, it's a good, it's also a good point. And I, and I, like I said, we've been talking about the past couple of weeks and I think we've been kind of settling on probably trying to get rid of the image and doing something more like have a little frame there or something. Yeah. Um, just a, a match match match, uh, like, yeah. Um, so even if we had Obama in a scrambled image, match the luminance and characteristics of Obama, um, you get about the same thing as if you had Obama and then you presented a picture of Hillary Clinton. Um, sure. So I, yeah. I, I would agree, but I think we need to. Uh, Ponder what the kinds of activations you want because if you if you are just kind of focusing on like case perception, then like, 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 
Mm -hmm. Folks, we're having I'm having a hard time hearing the questions. And uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Peter's on the on the other side of the table there. Um, he was just saying he was kind of piggybacking Tina's point and and saying, like, we need to uh, think about our what what we're trying to do with with our, our conditions and um, and update our stimuli accordingly. No, yeah, I got that impression. I just wasn't I couldn't hear the details of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. You're getting old, Sean. <laughs> well, that, is, that is that is no doubt true. <laughs> Uh, um, and so I don't, I don't want to make any claims with this little model. I was just to say that you could then assume that we don't really know what the, the architect, the, the functional layer architecture is in the, in the FFA and PPA, but we can assume that it's, it's similar to in early vision. So then we, we have a clear prediction here, right? So perceived faces, the feed forward input should go predominantly to the middle layers. Whereas the when in the imagined conditions, you should get um, oh, more in the superficial and or deep layers. And that's so we should be able to functionally dissociate the layers. And also just um, in the in the layer definition, that would that will be helpful to, to say, uh, is this middle peak real? Well, if you have a, a feed forward condition and a feedback condition, you should be able to see these different modulations of the layers that'll that'll help you uh, the confidence in the localization of the depths. That is cool. And, and that's all I got. Um, thanks to our PI, Alex. Renzo, who has the distinction of presenting and being thanked. <laughs> and, and Paul for, for giving us a lot of help in uh, getting the AFNI functions to, to work with our data. <laughs>